The Maverick Mindset podcast was conceived from my hunger for personal growth. By inviting guests onto the show that exhibit all the traits of a true maverick, such as resilience, courage, success, failure, and purpose, I get to hear their unique entrepreneurial life journeys and share with you, my listeners, key learnings, advice, and perspectives that we can all apply to our lives. Stuart, really welcome to the Maverick Mindsets podcast. Now, I've known you for probably five, six years, I think, and I wanted to invite you on because I think you've had a really interesting career in a creative industry as an entrepreneur, and I thought it would be great to capture some of those nuggets of information for the listeners and viewers and share kind of your life story and your learnings good and bad successes failures it's a, it's a really interesting story to tell mm. so perhaps first it's in a succinct a way as you can just explain your career how it started and what kind of the fast track of where you've got to today because it is a fascinating story so um yeah i so i i'm probably best most well known as the founder of all saints yep which is obviously now a uh, huge global brand um i started uh in the fashion business well when i was a kid uh, i was born in dundee in scotland um my mother mother uh single parent four kids no yeah. money and and the highlight of my life was was we would get a box or a suitcase of, of hand-me-down clothes from someone in her church and I, and i used to pull out like you know huge pair of trousers and go oh these are great mum can you make them to fit me and put pleats in like david bowie and and she would customize these clothes to fit me and 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 she taught me how to sew and uh and customize things myself so i used yeah. to crop things and or or you know get wide leg trousers and take them in or i used to get like an old suit an old man's suit and put all these seams in to make it fit me yeah um you know as a young kid because you know so long ago isn't it um we when we were kids there was no yeah. fashion world we, yeah. you know there were no <coughs> there weren't really any designers didn't really know you know you never there weren't fashion shops there was nothing like you know um the, the way the world is now where all saints reese yeah. zara h&m top shop where nothing existed none of it but there you was, must have gone to university <coughs> to obviously take on board a creative learning you know, creative course fashion how did that happen well so well when i was at school i used to customize uniforms and I, you know back in those days as well you'd go to selfridges and it was nothing like it is now but they had a uh, a guy in there that you could make sweatshirts and, and he pressed words onto them so i i used to make um customized sort of sweatshirts and sell it to other kids at the school yeah um and they all loved it and um and i was obsessed with art and 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 it, you know i was in the print club on a monday the life drawing class on a tuesday i was doing woodwork and on a wednesday i was doing um an oil painter on a th you know after school i'd be I'd, i used to leave finish school at half three and i i i wouldn't get home until nine o'clock at night yeah, every day i'd yeah. be obsessed Immersed with, in it yeah um but i didn't know you could do fashion as a i didn't know you could do it as a career or a business when when i went to do careers advice they said oh you know you'll have to be an architect because that that was about you know as far as the school was concerned that's the only job you can do as you know an artist where you can you know earn a living or whatever yeah. so i i applied to go to college to do maths and and physics uh a level and oh god o, o levels were easy i, I yeah. sailed through them with a's and uh, in every subject maths a level in the first day i was at the college i was like Oh, I couldn't understand what the hell they were talking about. A over squared X times equals Y. You know, I'm just looking at it thinking, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> There's no way on earth I'm I'm going to last in this. But how did you get to get to? Because it's Trent Poly, it's Trent U University. Well, th it? no, this was this was Tresham College in Kettering in Northamptonshire. Right, and uh, it was like a little local indie college, and it was an art foundation course, and. um and I turned up there, this little sixteen-year-old kid in a in a in a flight suit, um, with a with a studded belt, biker boots, a little cropped um, leather jacket that I'd, I'd cut the hem off to make it shorter, 
uh, and I I dyed my hair that morning. Um, I woke up in the morning. I I bleached my hair when I left school and I had my nose pierced. And and by the time that we that that was in you know June or whatever, by August when we started at the college, the roots had come through, and and I was like, oh, what am I going to do? So I dyed my hair burgundy. Well, I thought it was going to be burgundy, but it was actually fuchsia, bright fuchsia pink, and, and it was like seven in the morning. I was like, my God, what am I going to do? So I had first day at the college, slicked the hair back, went to the art foundation course. It was all, I was a little kid, like nervous, thinking, oh, fuck me, everyone's looking at me. I look like an idiot and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> and, I, and I went to the maths lesson and, and, and I'm just sitting there thinking, what the hell am I doing? And then I went for lunch um, and I sat down. And I thought, my life's over. I've, I've, I've made a huge mistake. What the hell am I doing? And some kid come over looking like um, Robert Smith from The Cure. And he's like, hello, mate, can I sit with you? And he sits down, he goes, what band are you in? And I'm like, I I'm not in a band. He goes, you must be, you look like a rock god. And, all, and then a girl came over, she looked like Alana Curry from the Thompson Twins. She had shaved head and a Mohican. And she's like, what band are you in? Like that. And I'm like, I'm not in a band. She said, well, you must be on the fashion course then. I went, what fashion course? She's like, have you not seen it? Come and have a look. So she took me into the fashion course and I walked in this room and there's sewing machines and mannequins and pattern cutting and you know big irons and steam and, and and the tutor i went i went strapped i thought jesus christ loads of beautiful girls i thought this is the class for me I, i've got to get out of this maths maths a level so i went up and i asked the woman if i could um join the class and she's like no you're too late you'll have to come back next year i went uh, no 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 you don't understand I, i'm i'm born to be in this room yeah, yeah and 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 the kid who looked like robert smith was going Miss, miss, have a look at him. I've, you know, you, you, you give, give. She went, can you sew? And I went, uh, yeah. She went, really? I went, yeah. She went, uh, right. So she handed me a piece of fabric and a pattern, and the five steps of making a pocket. She said, if you can make a pocket by the end of the day, I'll let you join the fashion course. And and I made the pocket in five minutes and yeah, gave brilliant. it to her. And she went, fantastic. So I, that's how I got on a fashion uh, course. And, and, and then, then I went to, to Nottingham Trent. Yeah. And then uh, while I was there, uh, in the first year, I, I messed around. I was, you know, you, you, back in those days, you used to get a grant, like about five grand, three and a half grand or something. And of course, I was straight down the pub. And, uh, and, um, and they, they were going to chuck me off the course at the end of the first year because I, I, I hadn't done all the work that they wanted. And I had to beg them to stay on the course. And, and, and I said, I promise you, I'll, I'll work really hard. Within three months, I'd won the Paul Smith Mont Blanc competition the student menswear design awards and i'd won the smirnoff fashion awards and that was at the royal albert hall in london and it was televised and um which would have been a massive shift right did yeah. you expect to, to win that or was it completely i had no i didn't have a clue and it was quite funny because i they the smirnoff fashion awards was the biggest thing in 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 student fashion student life if, if you could get on if you could get through to that it was like you know Every, uh, that was everybody's dream as a fashion student and so I, I back in those days as well there weren't really fabric shops especially in nottingham so i got little swatches and i stitched pinstripes on the fabric and i and i did this drawing of a, of a jacket that you sort of turn it inside out and you'd have stripes on one panel but not on the other um and, and i did a, a, a linen shirt with a zip rather than buttons and it was really really nice what i did and 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 sent it off and of course within about a month they send they send you a check for 500 quid um and and they like you've got to make that outfit and uh, all the other students were laughing going how are you going to stitch line stitch mark you know in in a whole suit like you know so, so i actually rang up a quilting factory and went to them and they they quilted they they, they stitched the lines for me and i made this suit and i, I honestly didn't i didn't think i was going to win uh, i didn't even tell my mum until the day before the Royal Albert Hall. And, and um, she came down, did she? She came down and she was she had a seat right up in the gods. And uh, anyway, they, 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 they did the show and my outfit was on the show. And and um, Jeff Banks stood up at the beginning and said, like, you know, out of two and a half thousand students, one of them is going to walk away with the designer of the year and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, then and it comes. You knew you'd won at that point. No. You, oh, on the, okay. I had right. no idea. I was just sat there thinking, like, you know, it's a laugh, you know. Yeah. 
And then they go, and the winner is Stuart Trevor. Oh my God. And, and all I could hear is my mum up in the, in the gods going, I knew he was going to win. Like, you know, she was screaming and all that. It was kind of funny. So um, I went back to college and, and I'd, Paul Smith had been offered a job to go and intern with him over the summer. Yeah. But, but David Reese rang the college every day for two weeks and, and I just ignored him because I didn't want to work for Reese. Um, I didn't really know what Reese was, but um, the dean of the faculty said, you've got to go and see this guy. You can't just ignore him. He's like, you know, industry leader or whatever. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, he, he said, I don't care about, you know, the internship, Paul Smith. You just, on behalf of the university, you need to return the f phone call to the guy and go and see him. So I rang him up and he said, listen, I'll pay for you to come to London. Um, come and meet me in my shop in the King's Road. Uh, King's Road was the epicenter of call back in those days. This is 1985. Um, that's Vivian Westwood is up, up at World's yeah. End and all the other shops on the King's Road. There was Jones, Quincy, that sell it all. I mean, if you, you, if you spent the day on the King's Road, it was like, it was like going to Disneyland for me. It was like the coolest place on earth. So I went to see him in his shop on the King's Road. And you couldn't get in the door. There must have been about a thousand people in the shop, all queued up buying stuff. I suddenly thought, wow, this is actually, this is a big deal. And I went up to see him and I took my, had a suit carrier and I, and I got the Smirnoff outfit out in the pool. And he was like, no, I don't, I don't need to see them. And he just hands me an envelope. And I'm like, what's this? And he goes, open it, open it. And I, and I went, what? Tell me, tell me what you want. Tell me what you, you know. He said, listen, he goes, I'm going to Italy next week. To Pity Womo, it's the world's number one men's welfare, and uh, and I want you to come with me. He goes and we, you, you, and I went, and he went. No, no, listen to me. He goes, it's the world's number one. He said you're going to be staying at the best hotels in the world. You're going to be eating the best restaurants in the world. You know, you're going to be going to the best shops in the world. You'll be going to the number one men's wear show in the world. And then I'm going to take you to the best fabric mills in the world. And then we're going to go to my little factory, and you're going to put stuff into work. These these you can design whatever you want. And it'll be in the shop about a month's time. And, I, and, I, and he said, I'm not, and I'll pay you like that. And I went, okay, like that. And I was cynical. But he said, open the envelope. I opened the envelope. There's 500 quid in it, cash, and, and a ticket to Florence. I was like, this guy's serious. Um, and that was kind of your, jer your journey into what would be like big, big time fa fashion company, retail. That, the, I'd, I'd, been a, I'd done a couple of other bits with, other companies but they weren't serious that's why i was a bit cynical when he gave me that cash and tickets pizza and he's and i and i went i was thinking all i could think about is what am i going to tell paul smith and he went a good thing is you don't have to tell paul smith like that and i went <laughs> well, he's right actually so i went to florence with him and um and it and it and it, it we did we stayed at the best hotels we ate at the best restaurants we went to the best fabric mill in the world and and, I, and he bought me a red gaultier double-breasted blazer and it was it was about 790 quid or something 795 quid that's like the equivalent of about 10 grand you still got it uh, do you know what it got moth eaten and 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 i and i chucked it out at, at you know i don't know when i was moving house once and i and i wish i hadn't because i could have patched it up and i'd have it i would have had it framed here it's such a beautiful jacket it was so when i that jacket he bought me that jacket and and and, and he bought me the jacket and said if i buy you that jacket Will you tell Paul Smith to fuck off? Like that. And I went, <laughs> that's what he's the exact words. And I went, well, I'm... and I didn't believe that he was going to buy me the jacket. So I went, yeah, all right then. I, I thought there's no way on earth. I thought if, if he's, he's got, he must be an idiot if he's going to spend 800 quid on a jacket. So he took me back to the shop and, and he tried it on. And they started to try and get out of it. He, Are you sure? It looks a bit tight on you. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, I knew he wasn't going to buy it. I knew he would, you know. And then he got the credit card out and he paid for it. And, and I walked out of that shop and I tell you, that jacket changed my life. I, we went to Paris and went to the Bandouche, number one nightclub in the world. Like, monsieur, monsieur. I was straight to the front of the queue and all that one. So when, when we were showing, I was showing Reese in Paris and, 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 and I used to wear that jacket. You'd get everyone, all the buyers from all the best Barney's New York and Bergdorf Goodman and Saks Fifth Avenue and Selfridges. They saw this kid wearing this, Ten thousand pound red Gaultier jacket. It was so beautiful. I used to open doors wherever, every, everywhere you went. But anyway, he bought me that jacket, and I ended up doing ten years at Reese. And and in that period, you got to remember when I first joined Reese, it was kind of like a suit.
company. Yeah, yeah. They mainly did sort of, he, David used to wear a navy blazer, pair of chinos, loafers, like a Baswegian loafer, and he'd, he'd wear an Oxford button down and a, and a shirt and tie. And, and, and a lot of what he did was preppy, sort of American collegiate sort but, of And you were probably coming from completely the other angle. I came from a completely different angle. I was doing like bomber jackets, like weird. He'd never seen anything right. like that before. And a hoodie, right? So you remember, this is 1985. Hoodies didn't exist. No one bought, uh, no one had a hoodie. But he asked me on the first day on the plane on the way to Italy, he said, what's, what's the big look? And we used to have a guy, um, a tutor that used to come in called Ian Batten. He was a really cool guy. He came in here a couple of weeks ago. It's really nice to see him. He used to wear a, a vintage Levi's hoodie with a zip and all that. And, but you couldn't get them in England. They, they didn't exist. No one knew what a hoodie was. So I was trying to explain to him. It's, yeah. I said, it's like a cardigan, but it has a hood. He goes, what, like a cagoule? I went, no, but it's, it's knitted. It's kind of, so I'm trying to describe it's like a sweatshirt. It's not like a jumper, but it's got and it's got a little pocket and it's got. A, so I, I anyway, we, I did a hoodie for Reese and we put them in and and my God, we, Reese was the first shop on the King's Road that had a hoodie and we couldn't get enough of them. I was buying, you know, started out buying fifty of them and then they'd sell out in one day. Then we'd order like one hundred and fifty to sell out in one week. So, so and, I guess that kind of gave you the, that whole casual look of, of Reese and the whole new market probably opened up for him. So he'd, he'd have been very thankful to you. Oh, I loved it, yeah. I mean, it was like a, it completely transformed the business. And, and then moving from that to, to All Saints, how did all, did you get up one day and say, right, that's it, I want to go and do something on my own? Did, did it happen by accident? So I, when I joined Reese, they were, I mean, basically was bankrupt and, and I completely transformed this business and, and I launched it internationally. We, we showed in Paris and sold it to Barney's New York and Selfridges and Saks Fifth Avenue, Japan. I'd built up all these contacts and, um, and I thought, God, if I can do, we were doing about 10 million in, in wholesale to all these department stores and everything. And I, and I, I just, I, prepared a business plan and I wrote down all the customers that I'd sold to and how much we'd they'd ordered. And I thought, and I, and I divided it by two and I thought if I had my own label, I could maybe do, and I worked out, I could maybe do two or 3 million quid or whatever, but I wasn't sure, but I went to the bank and the bank looked at it and just went, yeah, it's great. And I told them that basically when I met David, when I met Reese, the, the company was in administration, they had no money, but now it's like a 50 million yeah, pound yeah. business. And they went, well, well done, you know, but um, we're not going to lend you any money. And, um, but, I, and I'd thought about, which is a normal response from a bank. Yeah. And, I, and, um, but I, and I'd started working in Hong Kong with factories uh, that were making all the production for Ralph Lauren and Donna Karan and Calvin Klein and, and, and all this sort of stuff. And, and these factories, um, when, the, when, when the designers from Calvin Klein and Ralph and, Stone Island CP Company and all that. When they came to Hong Kong, they they used to have all the stuff that I'd done for Reese hanging mm. up in the studio, and they mm. and they loved it. The buyers were like, "Wow, you know, they they were copying things that I'd done for Reese to put into you know." Well, being, so the 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 owner of the factory came over and he said, "Listen, I'd like I'd like you to come and work with us. We 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 do ten million a year in England, and and we'll give you ten percent um, if you you know represent us as a as an agent." And and I was like. What a million! You've you've got a million quid, uh, and they and they were like, yeah. I said, listen, let me show you this business plan that I've got. So I showed them it, and 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 they took it away, and they came back about a month later and said, yeah, great. Get Have you got a name it. for it? And I thought of, I didn't want it, didn't want it to be my name. I wanted it a pseudonym for me. So uh, and uh, my initials are ST, like yeah. Simon Templar, the yeah. same. Yeah. And when I was twenty, I bought the car. So the Saint is a like a James Bond type yep. TV series with Roger Moore. Before he went on to do James Bond, he was Simon Templar. And I bought that car. Um, it's an old Volvo yeah, beard, you know, with little fins, really beautiful. And I'm at like 22 years old driving around London. Everyone's going, oh, look, it's the Saint everywhere. <laughs> so I was like, the Saint, that's a good one. Um, so I had a little comedy gas on notebook and I'd written, used to write everything in the little, little sketches, little, I used to keep notes of, everywhere I went on my travels or whatever. And I'd written down the Saint, I'd written ST, I'd, I'd written Stuart Trevor, 
And, I, and when I was on All Saints Road during the carnival, I looked up and I saw All Saints. Actually, that sounds really great, doesn't it? So I wrote All Saints in the little book. And I showed it to the buyers from Barney's and Saxmith Avenue and Selfridge. And ev virtually everybody, there was, there was about 30 ticks against All Saints and about two against the Saint. And yeah. So we thought, right, I'll All register Saints. the name All Saints. So I registered the name and um, launched, put a, put a collection together. And I, and I did all the things that I'd really, really wanted to do, but, you know, uh, in my life. So, so you I had a free, free run to do whatever you wanted. So I did. I, I, I got vintage biker jackets, vintage bomber jackets, uh, Max. I did a, I did a jumpsuit. I did a, um, uh, a Parker. Uh, I did a, a pea coat. And I made them out of um, Prada had just done, I just launched that nylon rucksack and every, the world was going crazy. This was 1994. The world was going crazy for Prada nylon rucksack. So I got the same sort of nylon and I made these parkas, pea coats, bomber jackets, jumpsuits, combat pants. And I also made it in moleskin and I, and, and I made everything, you know, the parkas that, you know, and I showed it in Paris and we wrote, one and a half million quid in, in which would have blown your mind at that point we couldn't it? believe it yeah so uh, we, we i had the little stand in paris and i had i didn't have any money so i had no mannequins whatever like, i just put a nail in the wall and i hung an outfit like six outfits all in a line behind me and i set the stand up and i came back in the morning and by i think nine o'clock the doors opened by 10 o'clock there was a queue of about 30 people on my you know trying to get on my little booth and giving me their kind of you know, this is luisa via roma the, the one where the, the shop i got my gaultier jacket from when i was at reese the, we want exclusive for florence in italy and all that this is the world's number one shop i'm like oh great in, in the old days what you what you would do as a designer you you so i started it in october 1994 I had until January to put a collection together. So you you draw it, you sketch it, you take vintage pieces, you send it to the factory, you get patterns made, you get the samples, you got January, you start showing it to the buyers. The buyers place their orders by March, you've got to start ordering all the fabrics to get yeah. the production done and you deliver it in so August, you, September. So you'd have been doing everything at that point, designing, everything. managing the factories, yeah. getting staff. Doing the selling and selling, yeah, and we had no computers back in them days yeah. as well. There was that you know we used to have uh, just a big ledger book and you used to put you know the pea coat in 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 black nylon and in black moleskin and uh, khaki moleskin or whatever, and you and you'd write selfridges that would order one medium, one large, one extra large, or ten medium, you know, whatever, and you, and you'd have to tot it all up and i mean it was there was no computers or anything I mean, everything was done like in the old days i think computers were around but nobody knew how to use them then they weren't like the computers that you get now you know um but we so we did that we delivered it and 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 so i think by september october we delivered the first collection of all saints it's this was october 1995 and and everyone sold out and yeah. and came back for repeat orders well fortunately i'd made a load of it in the uk and i could do repeat or bus yeah. business so uh, i mean it was and it was non-stop but then you what happens is you some of these people some of the buyers would place orders and then they didn't have the money to pay so you, you'd take the stock back so you end up with stock yeah so then no, i opened the no. shop yeah and you got into the shop and i was going to say how did you get into kind of brick and mortar yourself I, you just, you just fell into it or you realized you had to do it i had to do it because i had a, I had all this stock and i <laughs> uh, you know i had to turn it into cash so uh, i the first shop i opened was a concession inside hype df like hyper hyper in kensington um and when i was there uh i mean immediately we were doing 10 15 grand a week and that uh, no one else was doing that sort of money in this, in this and this year. would have been all kind of word of mouth because this was before social media no yeah. one was like smartphones didn't exist no. so people had to find you there must have been some buzz building well there was magazines by that point yeah. it was like the face and there was id and there was fhm and there was uh loaded and arena and all that and and so part of what i did is that I, I, I so the first collection i did a photo shoot and i did a really i i i, I came up with this idea there's a guy upstairs called herbie mensar who's a really cool black dude used to run a vintage um flea market in portobello uh, and it long dreads and there was like an old 
I used to go to Portobello on a Friday and buy vintage clothes to, you know, um, work on, you know, on the next collection and all that. And I was, and I'm, and I met this old, like a 70 year old black dude with long gray dreads. And, and he just looked the business and he looked like an older version of Herbie. And I said to Herbie, you know, I'd, would you two like, you know, be in the shoot with me for, for me for all saints? I've got this new, and they agreed. And Herbie said, I could bring some other mates and all. And, and there was a guy that used to do the door at the Atlantic bar and grill. And he was like a trans transsexual young black kid. Um, and, and he said, Oh, I'd like to be in your shoot and all that. And I'm like, yeah, come on in. So with the, with, with the first <laughs> shoe, I've got these five, five dreads walking down, wearing the gear, walking down the steps behind the Royal Albert Hall and this young, one young trans kid. And, and this, this, this image was, it's really quite an iconic image. No one was, I mean, you're talking 30 years ago, yeah. no one was doing. And that just created more buzz, opened more stores. And then the, the, the brand just took off in a massive way. Every store we opened was it just, went mental i mean what i used to i didn't know what i was doing but when i had a so i'd go to leeds and i'd find a unit and i'd open the unit do the store and i'd employ somebody who worked in you know reese or or harvey nichols or whatever to come and manage the shop and i'd make flyers up with it with the image on it and i'd say you know on it it'd say launch party september the 4th you know free booze or something like that and 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 i said go and give that to all the students at the local university and the local college and all around all the shops and of course they all turn up because they free they booze. want a free booze yeah. yeah and but they would turn up and they just go wow this is something that and i was doing these studded belts at the time with jesus loves you on them and all saints rocks and and i had t-shirts with jesus in the in the in a, the image of christ but like Che Guevara. and um, so it was all sort of rock and roll yeah people just turned up and they bought stuff and and then i, I didn't realize but i was targeting the equivalent of gen z wasn't it? all these kids yeah. within three years they're earning 50 60 grand a yeah, year yeah where did their first paycheck go straight in the till at all saints and because they were obsessed did, did you you obviously went from a startup small business it scaled very quickly and did how did you um cope with that mental shift that you've now got a proper big business to manage and you need grown-ups in there to help you. Well, I employed good people. Yeah. I mean, you always have to have really good people. I mean, someone asked me before about what, you know, it must have been stressful. And I was like, oh, yeah, it was too, you know, because we went from ordering 50 of this to 500 of this to 1,000 of this to, Jesus Christ, we need to order 5,000 or what, you know. It, that was a little bit stressful. But to be honest, we couldn't, we could do no wrong. Every yeah. single, we never... We, when we came to like the end of season, there was hardly anything ever left. There was only, you know, double extra large and extra yeah. small. Yeah. Everything that we, we used to, virtually everything that we did used to sell out. There was never any yeah. duff lines. So um, it, it wasn't that stressful. It was actually, I was having the time of my life. Brilliant, we were yeah. just having partying and, and, and opening shops. And, and, and we used to do events in all the shops. So, you know, we got up to Leeds or Nottingham. And so it, it was, I, I had the best looking staff that, the, you know, the best looking shops and you'd go to somewhere like Leeds, you'd go to the lo the best restaurant, you'd, get, you'd send you over a bottle of champagne and all that. And I was like, oh, that's nice. You know, did you tell them I was, you know, the boss is coming and all that. And they're like, oh no, that, that's not for you. That's for us. They, they, <laughs> the, our staff in Leeds and Nottingham and Birmingham, they were like local celebrities. Everybody wanted to, you know, every restaurant and bar and club, they, it was a bit like influencers. They used to pay them to come, to their bar or whatever and hang out because that was you know it was all saints was just iconic in every city you know and how did the journey kind of mature what happened as things got bigger and bigger and bigger well i had a i had a business partner who used to be the retail director from reese and um as the business grew it, it, there were some differences between us and, and i and i could see that i needed someone with more business acumen because the business was just going mental so i i i'd met a guy uh through I, I i had a concession store in iceland and i used to go over iceland every six months it was amazing it's a oh, fantastic iceland. place yeah and uh, not not the freezer food shop <laughs> uh the country and, and iceland is such a cool place um and this guy used to own all the shops in iceland he owned a donna Karan shop a paul smith shop and he and he built an all saints shop inside a mini department store and, and 
and he told me he was going to buy Karen Millen, um, and he introduced me to to Karen Millen and the, and, the, and the husband, and and he he he, we opened a shop in Birmingham, and we were doing about hundred grand a week. I think we did fifty grand on the Saturday, and I was with this guy, and he's the shop called me and said, guess how much we did today? And I was like, I, I don't know. And they're going, guess. I'm like, I, I've no idea. You did what you did 25 grand last week. Did you, what did you do? 30 grand to keep going. I was what, 35, keep going. I'm like, how much did you, he went 50 grand. I'm fucking hell. So I told the guy and he had a Karen Millen store next door. They did about five grand. Wow. And he's, his eyes, he was, he was oh, right. amazing, amazing. And then the shop manager called me and said, did you, did you tell your mate? about how much money we were doing. I said, why? He goes, the manager from Karen Millen's just come in the stores crying her eyes out. He sacked her. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I was like, what? Anyway, he drove me insane to buy into the business. He yeah. was going to put these systems in place that I didn't have to worry about it. He was, he had a, a production team and a, and a, and, a, and it, it, he said, oh, you, you'll just fly around the world designing stuff and opening new shops and, you don't have to worry about anything. I'll look after all of it. And, and so I persuaded my partners to sell to him. But unfortunately, he, he bought the majority share and then he put a £20 million loan on the table and, and he told me, like, you know, sign that. And, and, and I was like, oh, I want to see a business plan. And he's like, fucking sign it. Just get on, you know, you, 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 you want to be, a, if you want to be a big, huge success, you're a piss pot little designer. If you want to be a big success, just, and I was like, I'm not working with this guy. I can't do this. So I sold out and got out. I exited the company then. And how did you feel at that point? Because clearly All Saints was something you'd started from scratch. Did you like walk away thinking, you know what? A huge amount of money. It was kind of, I'd never, you know what? All that time I had a business doing 15, 16 million turnover. I was still paying myself like 40, 50 grand yeah. a year. I was, Which I, is a normal entrepreneur journey, isn't it? Yeah, you, you put it all, all the, way the money goes the straight back in. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I'm getting a check with all these zeros on it. I'm, I'm like, do you know what? I can always do it again. So I took the money in and ran and I, um, and I left him to it. And I, I tell you what, that 20 grand, that 20 million quid that they borrowed went in a year yeah. and they borrowed 198 million. And yeah. I mean, you know, business is fortunately they managed to sell through. I was worried about, this was in 2006, 2007. And of course the crash came in 2009. I knew I'd seen so many, you know, yeah. what they call recessions. I'd yeah. seen, I've been through it with Reese. I'd been through a recession. Yeah. We sailed through the first one when I was running all saints. Yeah. I, I, 2010, 11, they, they lost everything and someone bailed them out. So that guy doesn't, he's out of business and all that. Someone else bought it. And, and that's, you know, and, Fortunately, they've managed to turn it into a billion-dollar brand, yeah, which is great. Br so tell me about your current brand. I uh, have a new brand. It's called Stuart Trevor. Uh, I don't know where I got the name from, but um, but I'd, I'd registered uh, my name about 10 years ago, and I'd registered the stuarttrevor.com, the website. Um, and I started um, – I didn't intend to launch a new business. I, I um, we're, we're in this beautiful studio. I've owned this place for about 20 years. And the tenants moved out in, in June last year uh, and I didn't want the place to be empty. So I thought, you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll just, just get a load of old vintage pieces and I'll customize them and I'll paint on them and I'll badge them and I'll, and I'll, and I'll make something interesting and I'll invite people here and, and sell it to them and, and, you know, make a living or make, make a few quid out of it. Um, and um, I think I was here on a Friday evening and I'd made a load of stuff and I had some quite big, heavy duty entrepreneur business people came in and yeah. they just went, this is amazing. We've, you, you've got to, you've got to launch this as a brand and uh, you, you know, we I'll invest money into it. And a, a lot of people had asked me, I'd, I'd been helping young startup brands um, and introducing them to investors and, and every single investor, loads of them would say like, you know, do you know what? I used to love Reese and then, and then I discovered all saints and I loved it. I used to wear nothing but it, but I'm kind of over it why don't you do another brand? And I was like, oh, mate, the last thing the world needs is another clothing brand. Yeah, yeah. And they said, but I love what you're wearing. I'm so I just wear vintage. And they mm. went, no, but there's something. Up. And I went, oh, yeah, well, I add these little badges and patches and, and I paint on them. They're like, let's do that. And, you know, so I was like, yeah, do you know what? Yeah, well, what about a clothing brand that doesn't produce any clothing? 
and Which everyone is an was amazing like, concept right everyone loves that idea that the concept is basically i take garments that already exist because you know the you know the american military spend five billion dollars a year on clothes and all that for their you know their, their, i mean it's not that it's not all about military or whatever like that but but they do make some of the stuff i've got is from you know 1970 1980 really beautiful quality um and there's tons of it sitting in warehouses dead stock garments you know and i i got a load of them and i, and I got a load of old leather jackets and, and denim and i you know splattered them with paint and i uh, sewed patches on them i printed onto them and i beaded some of them and i put studs on them and just made something like really in and then i made a little white label with Stuart trevor on it and i sign it and i date it and there's a and it's got a lot and i write and if it's a one-off i write one of one so it's almost like a an artist and, and signing a work yeah. of art sort of thing so i'm yeah. creating mini works of art but they're yeah. not nothing mental it's just something slightly interesting yeah, and, something yeah. a bit. and and we launched so anyway well, well, on that when i had that these entrepreneur these business people came in on the friday i decided to do a launch party during london fashion week so i put it on social media and and this was on a friday evening by saturday evening i had about 500 people confirmed like you know the the phone just went mental i put it on linkedin and instagram and uh, people were ringing me up going oh, oh, can i can you put me down plus one so i suddenly thought god this is going to be busy so I, I i you know i got a drink sponsor in i had djs come in and we launched the, the brand and 750 people turned up there was queues outside people you know fighting to get in and all this sort of stuff and everybody walked in and hung everything up on little chains and people were just going this is incredible so we set about building a website, um, putting it all on there, building, and, and now we're in the process of you know building that business. And 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 the whole idea, the most important thing is 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 it's it's sustainable. I, I, I you look at these big, huge corporations out there, like you know Nike, for instance, they're they're chasing the billion dollars. Mm. Um, they they over they over ordered by three billion dollars worth of inventory last yeah. year. Their stock mm. dropped by thirty percent. There's companies like ASOS, 970 million turnover. They lost 130 million last yeah, year. Yeah. There's 300 million pounds worth of stock they don't know what to do with. Yeah. And some of these companies, I'm talking to some of the largest corporations, they've got 10,000 garments they don't know what to do with because mm. it, it was all going into landfill. Yeah. Um, and now they can't, you know, yeah. there's legislation the changes, coming yeah. in. So they're coming to me and I'm going to do a collaboration, take their garments and, and cut them up and paint them and, yeah. and, and things like that. So... And I think I had someone in the other day from the luxury sector that the, the lux sectors dropped. People are not mm. young kids. You know, five years ago, everyone was 500 quid on a Supreme puffer yeah. and all that sort of stuff. All that's finished. Yeah. My kids wear nothing but vintage. Yeah, no, it's and they an love all this. trend now, isn't it? It is, yeah. And so hopefully, hopefully we'll create a successful business out of a clothing company that doesn't produce any clothes so Stuart, what are your future ambitions have you got something you're really aiming for now beyond the brand or what are some of those things I, I have to make this i have to concentrate on this brand uh building it there's a lot of work to be done yeah um everyone loves it, it yeah. it's, it's like you know young kids and old and anyone in the fashion business people come in here and they look at it and and some of them are very serious business people like the ex ceo mm. of of diesel usa um i've had the, the, the head of uh retail at, at reese and at all saints so they come in they're like how are you going to scale this and when i explain to them that the last thing that we need to worry about is 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 where am i going to get yeah loads of clothes from there's yeah. there's there's a hundred so billion garments yeah. in production in the world and there's so much stock the last thing we need to worry about is that brilliant so i'm i'm, I'm building this business i think i want that to be a success I'm, I'm meant to be writing a book about um, my life and Brilliant. the story. And I, I've got a, a TV film production company that want to, to produce a, a, a like a film or a mini C. They, they've done it. You've seen all these documentaries on Alexander McQueen and Vivian Westwood and yeah. Dior, you know, like that. What the, people want to know about, um, I, I think, think from their angle, what they're saying is basically that, you know, there's this a kid from Dundee who grew up and wanted to be David Bowie and then ends up dressing all the rock bands in the world. And all that's kind of a, an interesting story. And it's not just about some big 
Alexander, mm. you know, Dior or Louis Vuitton or whatever. It's not. It's about a real person yeah, who's sure. created something from nothing. And so, you do a lot of work giving back, don't you? You go, you go and speak to school kids, your students, and I do a lot of that. I invite yeah. them here. I show them what I do. Um, I, I, I have interns that come in and and I'll teach them, you know, the process, and and I go to universities and give talks, and I just, you know, I'm trying to inspire the younger generation. Yeah. I never had that as a kid, right? And all that. I just had to do it all myself. Um, but I think it's it's really important because. I, I, it's all about the the, 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 yeah. the kids, isn't it, really? And do you think kids or the youth today have got bigger challenges than when you set out? Or is it... I don't know. Is, that, is more opportunities available? I don't know. It's it's The world's a different place, isn't it? Everything's more expensive now, isn't it? I mean, when we moved to London in the old days, you could get a flat for 50 quid a week. Now it's, you know, yeah, it's 500 expensive. quid a week. Where's a joke, isn't it? Everybody's, yeah. everybody's working their bollocks off just yeah. to pay the rent. Of course. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, um, I don't know, it's, there's a lot of opportunities out there, isn't there? Mm. I think if you work hard and you, and you pick a career that you enjoy doing, it's, it doesn't feel like getting yeah, up and going to work. I mean, when I launched All Saints, my ambition after 10 years at Reese was to create a company where people couldn't wait to get up in the morning. Yeah. And we used to start at nine. I had girls turning up at seven in the morning yeah. and, and boys that they, they, that people couldn't wait to get out of bed in the morning to come to work. And, and that's. Do you think that like. was because it was fun? Yeah. And it needs to be fun? That's the thing as well, that, that, and, and, and I forgot about that. Um, the whole idea of this this brand, what I'm doing is, I think everybody parks on about sustainable this and all this sort of stuff. I, I want to make, make a show that, you know, we, it, it's a lot of fun. You can have a lot of fun. You can save the planet at the same time. You, yeah. can, you know, we've got to do something about these mountains of clothes going into landfall. We've got to stop buying all this crap from you know fast fashion in polyester mm. rubbish that ends up in the bin yeah um because no one wants you there's there's no you can't recycle polyester it just ends up in landfill there's a there's a pile of clothing the height of mount everest going into landfill every seven minutes well it's scary numbers horrific what are we going to do i mean i'm talking 50 years time what's the planet going to look like yeah. so these kids i'm trying to talk to them about stop buying crap just Buy less, buy better, and wear it for life. Yeah, you know, I think that's that'll help. Whether whether or not we'll, whether or not it'll be, a, it, it's we can't carry on. I've, yeah. I've, I've, I came, to, I went to Pituomo in Florence in January, and I, I bumped into some friends of mine. They've been, you know, in the fashion game for thirty years. They're like, I'm wondering, and they, and they love what I'm doing. The new concept of a clothing company that takes existing clothes and makes them, you know, if, if, if they're like. These are serious fashion stylists. And, yeah. and they're like, I'm wandering around this show thinking, what on earth am I doing? Yeah. I'm on a merry-go-round and yeah. it's about to spin out of control. Yeah. That's, why are we just carrying on producing billions and billions and billions of clothes? So what I want to do is take other people's waste and, and, and make it interesting. I, and, I, and I hope, I, d I don't want to see factories closing down. I don't want to see Burberry going out of business and all this sort of stuff. But we can't just carry shift, on with this. Yeah. A shift in approach no because it's the, the, the you know there's billionaire all these billion dollar businesses chasing multi-billion dollar business you know what's all that about you know because you know that that you look at nike and they're, they're, they're three billion pounds mm, worth of waste. losses and all that that's not who's it's not doing their shareholders yeah. any good and it's not doing the planet any good it's not doing the customer any good people are bored my kids i asked them all nike are giving away free trainers they're like dad i'm not interested in nike mm. i'm like what free trainers? They're like dad, sweatshops. Not interested. Kids interesting. don't want that anymore. And what about things like a book or a podcast? Are you an avid reader? Is there a best book you've all, you read and changed your life, or do you listen to podcasts now? How do you consume? I like uh, autobiographies. I yeah. like to read. Um, I, you know, um, I've, I've uh, John Lydon, um, Johnny Rotten. I, I loved reading his book. Um, Keith Richards, I loved reading his book. That was, that, you know, about, you know, what inspired him as a young kid. Because yeah. they start out as little kids and they yep. go on a journey. Go like on a journey and it's through some peculiarity they end up becoming a huge success or whatever. And I, I like reading those sort of things, you know. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I love reading old books. Like my favourite book in the world is uh, Charles Dickens' 
um, Great Expectations. Wow. Which is an amazingly well-written book. He was such a genius author, wasn't he? Amazing. But also, it's about a young kid who wants to grow up and be somebody. Yeah. And, and he realises, through the journey, that it, it, when he sat out, he wanted to be a gentleman, but he realised when you get there that most of these gentlemen are idiots. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and, he, and he, he's happier back on the back on the farm or back at the in the mill of whatever you know the and, blacksmiths and podcasts do you, do you do you subscribe to podcasts listen to many i do but i don't have a lot of time yeah. I'm, I'm just so busy all the time and I, and you know I, I and i and i like i like the you know like my my missus in the film industry i like i like really good quality films and yeah. things like this but um now and again I, the, the, there's some really good podcasts out there and I, this is a good one yeah yeah so we exactly <laughs> well every mindset's gonna, gonna be growing it yeah yeah on that note look really inspirational to talk to you today appreciate your time and a lot of the listeners and viewers will be listening to your story thinking you know there's so many nuggets in there they can kind of draw out and learn from so i do appreciate it very creative very inspiring individual for me real maverick cheers thank you very much thanks Stuart. Lovely to see you mate cheers